Um, hello, everyone, and thank you all for, for joining. It's a pleasure to virtually be, be with so many people. Uh, my name is Mark Fine. I currently live in, in Israel, in uh, Tel Aviv, and I spent the past uh, 15 years working for NCSY, a Jewish youth organization, um, and the past uh, seven years running trips to Poland and Israel for high school students, and had the pleasure of uh, meeting Julie and teaching a class uh, just, a, just a week ago on Yom HaShoah, on uh, poetry and the Holocaust. And what especially motivates me uh, when it comes to teaching and Jewish education is really the intersection of the, the Torah and of Jewish wisdom and how it can practically impact and guide the way that we, we live our lives, uh, which is one of the reasons why I ended up as a uh, mental health advocate and all sorts of other fun things. So excited that you're here. And the, the gist of the course today, and really the course for the next six weeks, is that Shavuot, uh, the, the holiday in which we receive the Torah, is, is coming up. And there's this custom uh, between the beginning of Pesach and the receiving of the Torah of Shavuot, of what can we do to prepare ourselves for the receiving of the Torah. Uh, so there's a custom to learn a uh, perkei avot, ethics of our fathers, uh, specifically to focus on how can we personally prepare? What are the character traits that we can develop so we're in the right mindset with the ability to fully embrace our, our Jewish lives? And the idea behind this course was that every week we would pick a different value, uh, explore some of the sources within Judaism for that value, and then finish the, the class uh, with some sort of reflective activity, uh, something that integrates that value back into our own lives. So that way it's not staying purely on a theoretical level, uh, but it's something that we'll actually practically implement. So today uh, we're gonna study together the, the value of compassion. And what I'm gonna ask, uh, because we do have the chat function, is at any point, please feel free to ask questions, offer comments, um, that's really what makes this um, as incredible as, as possible. Uh, either myself or Julie uh, will, will read them. And you can see you will get a prompt response from, from Julie on, on that front. So uh, let's begin. Uh, first, anytime we're going to have a conversation, we need to define our terms. What is it that we're talking about exactly? So what I'm going to ask is, if you can put in the chat, what is the definition of compassion? What are we actually talking about? There are lots of words that get thrown around. Uh, pity, sympathy, empathy, compassion. What actually is the definition of compassion? And if you want to take a guess, what's the actual Hebrew, Hebrew word for compassionate? And pop that into the, into the chat. Um, Larry said compassion is feeling for another. Excellent, Larry. Thank you. Loving kindness, empathy, chesed, feeling for another. Uh, being able to experience another's feelings. Um, unconditional positive regard. Being able to feel what another is going through or feel to envy with them. Uh, to suffer with. Uh, beautiful. So let's hold all of those definitions. Uh, wanting to help from the Latin, compassionaire. There is always one person who knows the Latin. Uh, Anna, if you could elaborate on what the Latin root is, and then we'll compare it uh, to what the, the Jewish root is for compassion, and that will be an excellent starting point for what the similarities and, and differences are. Uh, I'm, uh, thank you, Rabbi Dr. Schiffman. We're going to talk about compassion for self as well. Um, so the Hebrew word for compassion, as uh, Zach Beer pointed out in the chat, is rachamim. Rachamim from the, the root of a uh, rachem, uh, which actually means womb. So the root for compassion in Hebrew is the same root for womb. And we're going to press pause on that for a moment. But a question that I want you to think about as we go through this class together is what's the connection between compassionate and the word womb? And that's going to be a question we come back to at the end. And I think that's actually what's going to be the fundamental distinction between compassion 
and pity, sympathy, and empathy is understanding why the womb is actually the source of all compassion. So where does Rachamim appear in the Torah? I'm going to send the links to Julie who posted in the chat. Um, I thought it's only appropriate um, that we start with uh, a My Jewish Learning article. Um, the 13 Attributes of Mercy, where immediately after the, the sin of the, the golden calf, we learn this, this phrase, Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum V'chanun. God and God, all compassionate and merciful. And it's a phrase that pops up again um, in our uh, liturgy for, for Yom Kippur, uh, specifically in the prayer, Hayom Harat Olam, that today the world was created, that God should judge us like a God, a relation, father's relationship with their son, Kerachem Av Al Banim. That the same way a father is compassionate toward his son, so too God should be compassionate toward us. So what I want to pull out at this moment, again, is that familial connection. The same way that Rachamim is the root from womb. Again, Terachem Ab Albanim. There's another parent-child connection. And why is it that compassion, specifically in some level, is based off of the parent-child relationship? If I were to ask you about judging people favorably, what is a classic Jewish source that people love to quote? There's even a beautiful song that I will not sing because that is not why you're in this class. From Perkei Avot. Also, Leviticus from last week's Parsha. Um, bonus points for anyone who uses Leviticus or Deuteronomy because they are fun to say and I don't get to say them often enough. So, Havedan et kol ha'adam l'kapsuchut. So now, for all those grammarians out there, um, and there's got to be at least one on this 152-person call, especially because we already had the Latin quoted once. If you were writing this to actually, if you actually meant to say to judge someone favorably, how would you have written that in the Hebrew? It would be Havedan et Adam. To judge someone favorably. Why is it et kol ha'adam? Why do you think it's judging all of the person? Havedan et kol ha'adam. Why the entirety of a person? How does that extra word, hakol, entirety, change the entire meaning and understanding of the phrase? Feel free to, either you can, if you want, you can raise your hand. Um, it helps to know a person's struggle or past. So thank you, Carol. Why does it make a difference? Why does it matter if we know someone's story or not? How does that change how we relate to them? Okay, if you know their intentions. Oh, the fundamental attribution error. Thank you, Rin. I now have to use another one of my favorite words called heuristic. So yes, so the fundamental attribution error is as follows. When I do something, I know my entire life story, so I understand why I did it. But when I meet someone else, all I can see is what they did, so I attribute it to something that they are, something that's inherently them. I don't know their circumstances, so I don't take that into account. It's not that they did something. They inherently are whatever it is that thing that they did. Me, I cut myself some slack. Them. I don't know them. So I just assume that's essentially who they are. So thank you for pointing that out. That is exactly, and I will share the sources here, um, what the Sfat Emet says, et kol ha'adam. So the Sfat Emet explains, why does it say ha'adam instead of just adam? For when a man's actions are judged, one cannot look at the one act in isolation. Rather, his entire personality must be taken into account, his background and what he has gone through. This way we may realize that we might even act similarly in, in their place. 
One could also argue this is why you can't judge anyone at all because you can never know their entire story. And there is a classic example. Um, it's classic because I know it. Um, I love it when people say that in a class, like, oh, there's a famous source that I know. Um, but now um, you're all going to know it also. And it's a source whoop, from Gemara 27, 127b. And I will share so we can read it along together. And it specifically demonstrates to what extent we need to go in order to understand someone's background and, and story. And if there were fewer people, we could read it in very dramatic voices. The sages taught us, one who judges another favorably is himself judged favorably. And there was an incident involving a certain person who descended from the upper Galilee and was hired to work for a certain homeowner in the south for three years. On the eve of the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, he said to his, oh, his homeowner, give me my wages and I will go and feed my wife and children. Pay me for what I've done. And the homeowner said to him, I have no money. He said to him, in that case, give me my wages in the form of produce. He said to him, I have none. The worker said to him, give me my wages in the form of land. The homeowner said to him, I have none. The worker said to him, give me my wages in the form of animals. He said to him, I have none. The worker said to him, give me cushions and blankets. And he said to him, I have none. The worker slung his tools over his shoulder behind him and went to his home in anguish. Now, if any of us were in the place of the worker, you can imagine what we might be thinking about the homeowner in this situation. Let's play out the rest of the story. After the fast Sukkot, the homeowner took the worker's wages in his hand along with a burden that required three donkeys, one laden with food, one laden with drink, and one laden with types of sweets and went to the worker's home. After they ate and drank, the homeowner gave him his wages, finally paid up. The homeowner said to him, when you said to me, give me my wages, and I said I have no money, of what did you suspect me? Why did you not suspect me of trying to avoid paying you? The worker answered, I said, perhaps the opportunity to purchase merchandise inexpensively presented itself and you purchased it with the money that you owed me and therefore you had no money available. The homeowner asked when you said to me, give me animals. And I said, I have no animals. What did you suspect me? The worker answered, I said, perhaps the animals are hired to others. The homeowner asked when you said to me, give me land. And I said, I have no land. Of what do you suspect me? The worker answered, I said, perhaps the land is leased to others and you cannot take it from the land of the lessees. The homeowner asked, and when you said to me, give me produce, and I said, I have no produce, of what did you suspect me? The worker answered, I said, perhaps they are not tithed, and that is why you cannot give them to me. The homeowner asked, and when I said, I have no cushions or blankets, of what did you suspect me? The worker answered, I said, perhaps he consecrated all of his property to heaven, and therefore nothing was available at present. The homeowner said to him, I swear by temple service that it was so. At that point, the homeowner immediately got to pay his worker. Now the homeowner said, and you, just as you judge favorably, so may God judge you favorably. On a certain level, that's crazy. <laughs> like to take that level of judging people favorably, of optimism. And yet, I think this happens all the time. I mean, I could just think of a personal story from last week. Um, there was someone I was texting with. Uh, we were supposed to set up a time to, to date. Um, she totally ghosted me. And this is being recorded, so that's awesome. Um, and afterwards, um, I called the next week just to like check in because why not? Um, turns out um, there was someone in her family who had passed away. She really wasn't checking her messages. We had just met. Um, and now that I called, she's like, oh, I'm so sorry that we fell out of touch. This is the story. Here's what's going on. Okay. And how different would we relate to people? If we took that moment of pause. Instead of assuming they were doing something to us, which is really what the assumption was that there's something going on that can explain their behavior. Context is all. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> and here's where I want to make the distinction between uh, pity, sympathy, uh, between pity, sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Tie it back into um, the question that we started with and conclude with a video and activity. 
Kitty is, I feel bad for you, and I'm better than you because of it. There's a power differential there. I feel bad for you because I have something that you don't. You are lacking. That, that's pity. Sympathy is, I'm sorry that you are experiencing something bad. I acknowledge that you're going through something, but there's still that differential there. Empathy would be, let's sit in this thing together. I'm willing to go down into the pit. For anyone who hasn't seen Brene Bound's Sympathy versus Empathy video, please watch it. Total life changer. But then there's compassion. And compassion is not just, I acknowledge that you're going through something. It's not just, I'm going to be there with you. It's, how can I help relieve you of what's going on? It's one more level up. Uh, the name of the video is Brene Brown, Sympathy versus Empathy. But compassion is one more level up when there's no longer uh, a separation there. And there's a great definition. I read this in a Shalom Hartman article um, that this thing was best understood by a Jewish German philosopher, Herman Cohn. That compassion is all about the expansion of the I. That the truth is compassion enables people to extend the limitations of the I, enabling them to identify with the other and see them as a peer. When there's no longer separation, that's when there's space for compassion. Because you're no longer feeling with, you're now helping to alleviate. And that's why I think, we should go all the way back to why Rechem, why womb? Because when, and the parents on this call could speak to this much more powerfully than I can, and if you're willing to share, please post in the chat about what's it like when you have a child? And especially for any mothers on this chat, what it meant to carry a child. And that even though there might be a now physical separation after birth, family is family. And a child's always your child. And there really isn't that separation. And you relate to what's going on in their lives fundamentally differently because they're an extension of. And that's why I think the womb is really the source of compassion. And why in Yom Kippur, the specific metaphor that we use is the same way that a parent is always with and always willing to relieve the burden of their child because there's no separation there. There's of one flesh. That is what compassion is and how differently would we operate in this world if we related to people without separation. Compassionate isn't feeling bad for, that's pity. It's not even feeling with, it's actively helping to alleviate. And we learned this in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, but there's a source that's the Halakha Vidrachav, imitatio Dei for Anna and the Latin speakers among us, um, to imitate God in his ways. And there are different uh, sources that the characteristics of God are specifically the ones that we are supposed to, um, supposed to implement. Um, and there are a couple of, um, examples um, that people chatted um, to understand a child's needs of all kinds to take care of and ensure health. Um, and their, their relationship is symbiotic. Um, the child becomes your world when carrying the child, you are his or her protector. Um, compassion also involves uh, humility um, because you're saying, I am not the center of the universe. Thank you for that, Tali. Um, excellent question from, uh, from Sharon. Um, do you think someone who is childless can feel compassion the same way someone who has a child children has a child children? Um, as someone who is currently childless, um, I can't answer that question because I don't have a before or after. Um, what I what I do fundamentally believe is we access traits um, to the best of our abilities and understandings in the moment. And just because something is presented as a root, um, or perhaps something is represented as a paradigmatic example of what compassion could be, 
Um, I don't think that's the only example. And if in any way um, someone heard from me that um, you are incapable of accessing compassion unless you are a parent, um, I apologize for that. In no way um, at all is that uh, what I'm saying. Um, rather that it is an example of a type of relationship. And as someone who's a teacher, and I know a couple of other people are popping into the chat now, um, family is a metaphor, womb is a metaphor. Um, and there are all sorts of family relationships that we have um, that aren't necessarily blood relationships. And I would say the same exact thing, even though someone didn't mention this um, in terms of adopted children. Um, it's not about the blood relationship as much as the active relationship that is created and cultivated. Um, and I think it's a powerful metaphor, regardless of where we are in our own lives um, at, at the moment. Um, there are a couple of um, questions coming in, which I'm going to read in a moment, but I do want to um, conclude before getting to those questions with sharing a, a section of a brief video. Um, and it goes to how differently would we see the world if we understood uh, what people's stories were. Um, in advance, it is about um, people who are entering a hospital. Um, I do recognize that's something that could be um, triggering given the current moment. So just be aware. Um, there's nothing graphic in it. It's like one of those heartfelt with the like violins in the background sort of thing, um, but it does involve hospital imagery. And what I'm going to ask is as you will, before you watch the video, pick someone in your life. Um, or a situation that you currently have in your life. And I'm not going to ask you to share, but pick someone or a current conflict that's going on in your life. How would that shift if you didn't view a separation between you and that person? How would it shift if you knew more about the context of their story? What would change if you came at it from a compassionate lens? in terms of how you related to that person. And by the way, that person could totally be yourself because there are all sorts of aspects of ourself and our own internal lives where if we had compassion for. Um, so again, just to clarify, um, currently in your life, we interact with lots of people and some of them we act compassionately toward and some of them we don't. So I'd like you to think of someone who's going on in your life right now, just a real person in your life um, or a real conflict in your life. And if you approached it with a compassionate lens or an eye in tova, a good eye, and tried to explore more of the context or viewed it not as this is someone who's separate from me, but we are in this together and how can I alleviate what's going on with them? How would that shift your relationship with that person and that conflict. So I'm going to share a portion of this of the short video and then um, bring it back to to answer some of the questions in the in the chat. Tech permitting. There we go.
So for um, so many reasons, um, I, I love that, that video. Um, and yeah, um, to answer your question, yes, I, I have shown this video to, to high school students, depending on the, the framing. And to, to summarize, um, to summarize today, and to leave again with some some practical tools, um, we start with defining what is what is compassion in the Jewish in the Jewish context. Idea of rachamim, of mercy, and really starting from um, starting from room, from womb, a womb as a metaphor. And what would happen if you viewed the world where there wasn't a separation between us and other other people? Not just feeling that for, not just feeling with, but actively working to to alleviate. And we learned the Gemara and Shabbat together about even to the most extreme example, uh, what would change if we viewed other people optimistically and were curious about their context. Uh, we learned the Perkeavo about have a it kol haadam, the entire person, their entire context, their entire story. And what would change if we knew their entire story? Um, and then we had that final reflective uh, video, um, which again, everyone's walking around with their stories that we don't necessarily know or are aware of. And what would change if we viewed people through a compassionate lens? What would change um, if we were curious about it? And we thought about someone in our own lives. Uh, could be a conflict, could be a person, uh, could even be ourselves. And how do we relate to them? And some practical questions that can really get us in that mindset would be, I came up with what I think the reason was. What are other explanations um, to get past, I forget who said it, I apologize, um, the fundamental attribution error. What are other explanations, as far-fetched as it might seem to me right now, that could explain why they're doing this? How am I showing up in this conversation? Am I showing up as someone who's positive and authentic and caring and compassionate? What's my responsibility um, in terms of what's, what's happening? Um, and to go back to that line in the Gemara that you will be judged however you judge others. Um, in the Gemara, it's presented as a sort of final judgment, as God will judge you the way that you judge others. Um, I also firmly believe that the way that we uh, relate um, to other people impacts the way other people relate back to us. And if I am with other people in a compassionate way and a gentle way, sometimes at first that can be really shocking to people because they don't know how to relate to that. Um, but the more that we are with other people in that way, the more that people relate to us in that way as well, and a virtuous cycle ends up being, uh, being created. Um, and again, the distinction, and I know it's a nuanced one, and happy to share more articles afterwards, um, of, um, pit of uh, empathy for sympathy. Empathy is the feeling with. Uh, compassion is actively trying to alleviate some of what they're struggling with. Um, it's nuanced, um, and sometimes I wonder whether it can be a distinction without difference. Um, I think there's definitely more to, to talk about there. Um, I just want to be sensitive, um, sensitive to the time. And yes, just to share some of the reflections that people are sharing, uh, because it's, it's really beautiful. Um, Dr. Andrew Barash, it's amazing how much su less suffering there is within the self when even just thinking uh, more compassionately. Um, instead of judging, like that's that word, judging. Oh, how did I end up here? Well, what's my whole story? What if I treated myself compassionately? What are alternative ex explanations? How can I alleviate my own uh, pain? Um, Beth, oh, often we project our own unprocessed pain onto other uh, people. And that gets into, well, what am I bringing uh, to, the, to the conversation? Um, uh, yes, we do have a link to the video. I will post it, I will post it now. Um, Thank you. I'm not going to share the name because it's a little more private. Um, someone uh, who's watching actually was at the Cleveland Clinic uh, for surgery twice in the last two years, um, and she truly felt this beautifully. Um, and this goes back to never knowing people's stories. Um, like for me, this was an inspirational video. For someone on this call, uh, they were one of the people in the video. And how often do we, do we say things without even realizing the impact that it's having? Um, both in the positive and in the more challenging. Like I had that on this call also when it came to talking about womb as a metaphor um, and not clarifying early enough on and I might have unintentionally caused pain to some people because I didn't recognize how it could be um, interpreted. Um, 
okay, so I get to acknowledge that and, and reframe. Um, but how different would we operate in our lives if that's the perspective that we took toward the world? Um, there's a great question, how do we feel compassionate towards that person if we don't know the other person's context? Whenever we don't know something, we make something up. Like, I don't know, uh, we'll pick on Lee at the moment. I don't know Lee. Um, he looks like he's writing and taking notes. I just know that he's looking down and writing. Now, I could make up that he's bored and doodling. Um, alternatively, I can make up that he's super passionate about the material and writing it all down because he wants to remember it for later. I don't know. All I know is that Lee is writing something down. The rest is my imagination. And I don't think we're always aware of how often we're just making stuff up about other people on the world around us. And if we can catch it and say, hey, like, here's what I actually know. What don't I know? That can already get us in a more humble mindset and a more compassionate mindset. A sheer just shared a great game. Um, I like to play a fun game. A sheer. I totally share your definition of the word fun. Uh, on my summer program, like, oh, we're going to play a fun game. And they're like, oh, so we're going to do an intense reflective activity. And I'm like, yes, that's the fun part. Um, whatever. Uh, uh, trying to imagine three alternative positive explanations for someone's annoying behavior instead of the automatic negative one that I usually come up with first. Um, Cynthia says, I think of all the things no one knows about me, and I assume there's that much hidden in other people also. Um, uh, Ross uh, shared a beautiful reflection about the man in the hospital, uh, daughter getting married, and marriage is one of the last steps in the cycle of life before death. I mean, I felt this was why he was so determined to be there. I felt his suffering. Even in the video, we're making up a story and tying it back to our own experiences. And I say make up not to denigrate it, just the opposite. Make up because that's the power that we have. And I'm a firm believer, and this is getting to brace you in a different concept, and then I'll be quiet because Julie has me on the clock, that words create worlds. And we get to choose to a certain degree what world we want to create. And that depends on what words we use and what attributes where, um, what attributes we choose to access within ourselves. And that's why Aaron asks, it seems it's easier to be compassionate with others when you learn their story. How can we practice compassion without invading someone's privacy? And I think that gets back to humility. I don't know what I don't know. So I'm going to be curious. And that curiosity doesn't have to be, tell me everything about your life. Frankly, it's none of my business what's going on in my life. And I think that's the next level. Um, and that's not to say I'm there. I just think it's a natural progression of, oh, how much easier is it when we know their story? Yeah, it makes it a lot easier when we know their story. And what if I didn't need to know anything about them to be compassionate? What if I didn't need to know one iota of their story? Well, what if I could just be compassionate with everybody that I met? And yeah, it makes it easier for me to know their story. But why does my behavior shift towards someone when I hear, again, in air quotes, oh, they're a cancer patient. Oh, I need to treat you differently now. A, that's very quickly can potentially get into the pity land. And B, someone else's circumstances shouldn't change our orientation toward them or toward the world. That's why everything that we're doing, whether it's muster, is the emphasis on personal development. I get to change myself, or if you don't like the word change, I get to access parts of myself that I haven't accessed previously. And that's going to alter the way that I now relate to other people, regardless of what I know about them. Because it doesn't matter. Simply by existing, and this goes back to the metaphor of being born, simply by existing, they are deserving. Simply by existing, they are deserving. And I'll flip that because I know this is something I sometimes have a challenge. Simply by existing, I am deserving and I am worthy. And I think with that, um, Thank you for joining um, the first in a series of, uh, of six lectures. Um, next week, I believe we're doing a wisdom and it will follow a, a similar format of what are some of the, the sources, what are some of the roots, uh, playing it out across the rest of uh, the different examples of Jewish literature. And then how can we conclude with a 
applying it back to ourselves and our own internal work as people, um, and then applying it uh, to, to others um, as well.